walk down to the Capitol. Washington, D.C., January 6th, 2021. A frenzied mob marches on the U.S. Capitol. Many military veterans were among them. I think it's absolutely heartbreaking to see veterans involved in these things. And I know for a lot of them that their hearts are in, in some ways in the right place. We just don't live in the same world of truth anymore. Many had served overseas, had risked their lives for their country. Now, they were prepared to use violence to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president. All of us, men, women, people who have served or not, old people, children, everyone becomes more violent in the aftermath of warfare. Was the attack on the Capitol a major turning point in American history? Anybody who says that this can't happen in a worse way, either they're ignorant um, or they're part of the problem. How could something like this happen in the birthplace of modern democracy? I've often asked myself, how did I end up on one side of that door and my fellow veterans who raised their same right hand and took the same oath that I took, how did they end up on the other side of that door? So on January 6th, I had told all the members of my staff not to come in to the office. Um, I had heard reports of Boogaloo Boys and Proud Boys and others um, filling flights to come into the Capitol. I think as a lot of us watch things unfold on the 6th and then have, have looked at a lot of the footage since, you see things we recognize as veterans. You can actually see, if you look at it, the militia groups, you know, the Oath Creepers, the Three Percenters, the Proud Boys, they're organized. They're behaving tactically. They understand the, the dynamics of a crowd, and they're maneuvering to exploit that mass of bodies. You know, so you see an organized line of militia members with shields ready to go, ready to exploit a breach, pushing the crowd in certain directions. The mob broke through into the Capitol. They evacuated leadership. They evacuated the floor. But they had forgotten that there were about two dozen members up in the gallery. The floor of the house was evacuated, but there was no safe evacuation route, evidently, um, from the, the gallery. We were trapped, there was no way out. This was one of the more shocking moments of my life. I made the decision to call my wife and let her know that I uh, love her and tell the kids that I love them. Here we are in the Capitol! No looking back now, boys. No looking back. This is what we fucking lived up for. Everything we fucking trained for. This was the kind of experience that I expected as a U.S. Marine in Iraq, but could never even imagine happening as a United States congressman in Washington, D.C. You know, many people have seen the pictures. They had barred the door to the gallery. They were banging on that door and breaking the glass to that door. After the violence was over, one police officer and four demonstrators were dead. 150 officers injured in the riot. Four of the officers on duty that day later committed suicide. He said, we did a good job. Among those charged because of the riot were a disproportionately high number of US military veterans, a fact that has deeply unsettled Americans and laid bare social divisions. For some, like Michael Washington, it's incomprehensible. He's a veteran himself, and he knows what it's like to lose a loved one in a military conflict. And my son Michael was killed in action in Afghanistan on June 14th, 2008. And when you join the military, there's a lot of, a lot of competing ideals of why you show up. And, and for most of it, there's, a, there's a, a large amount of patriotism. But you never lose focus and never lose sight that, you know, I'm here in this country maybe to give them a better chance to experience what we have in America. Or it's not perfect. My son died doing that in Afghanistan, only for us to, to lose that sight here. Veterans 
who swear that oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, of all Americans, they should understand how dangerous and unpatriotic this insurrection was. They were trying to overthrow democratic election results. They shouted for the hanging of our own vice president. That's a coup attempt. Watching the insurrection happen, and we're gonna call it that because that's what it was, and watching veterans participate, being at the vanguard of that insurrection, it just, it's just mind boggling, but I don't, I don't have a really good answer for why, why veterans would do that. I asked a buddy of mine, I said, hey man, can you, uh, can you get me some ammo? Some decent ammo, I can't find any. He said, yeah, man, I, I heard that there's a drug dealer down the corner, he's uh, actually slinging ammunition now instead of drugs. So, bought some ammunition from the drug dealer. <laughs> Eric Braden lives in a remote part of Texas. The US Army veteran says the attack on the Capitol was justified. He wasn't there himself, but here on his ranch. He makes his feelings about the U.S. clear. When people look at these, these guns, these rifles and these handguns and so forth, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks that see something that causes violence. They see something that's dangerous and shouldn't be allowed in society and so forth. What they don't realize is that this is what gave us our freedom. This is what won our independence. This is what protects us from, from attack. It's not just our God-given right, you know, to defend ourselves. It's our constitutional right, but it's also, it's just right, you know, when you, when you think about it. Uh, this rifle will never hurt or harm anybody unless something that comes up against it. Another U.S. Army veteran is Christopher Goldsmith. His life was also shaped by military service, but he sees the U.S. very differently. I spent my whole life wanting to join the military. I mean, there's a photo right behind me of me when I was probably like five years old, wearing camouflage head to toe with a pair of dog tags. I feel like most kids that I grew up with went through a phase of wanting to be a cop or a firefighter or an army man, right? I never grew out of that. Then when I was 16 years old, September 11th happened, and it kind of put a different spin on that desire to serve. I went to go out and find bad guys and find justice. So this when I was 18 years old in basic training, and it's the standard photo that you take before you know what anything on the uniform means. I mean, this is ignorance is bliss right here. That's, that's what this photo is. A year later, Christopher was deployed to Iraq. I became this unofficial on-the-ground intelligence reporter. On May 15, 2005, we got called to uh, respond to a body that was found in a trash dump outside Sadr City. When we got there, uh, we realized that it wasn't a body, it was a bunch of bodies. And uh, I had never experienced anything like it. And now as I was taking photos, close-up photos of these faces of victims of murder and torture, I was looking at their wounds and looking at the packaging tape that was wrapped around their eyes and imagining the terror that they felt. And every time I snap a picture, one of those faces freezes. And the way that it froze on the screen, it froze in my head. But that was just a day of deployment. And I had six and a half months, seven months left of Iraq to deal with that. I went in as 11 Bravo to the Army. I scored fairly high, so I went to airborne school, which was gonna be my next uh, step of training for Special Forces. And uh, during that time, I ended up getting injured really badly. When I came home, I had spent my entire adult life up to that point, you know, either training for combat or in combat. It was hard for me to think of anything positive in any way, whether it's for myself or for my country or for democracy or for the world. I 
couldn't help but base my beliefs and my feelings on my experiences, all of which had been horrifically negative. When most come out of the military, they're coming out to a world that they no longer understand anymore. You really get lost in that life when you're in the military. You know, what happens is you have the camaraderie, the friendship, all the good things that you have in the military. And then when you come out, you kind of have society that's undisciplined, incapable, and, and just downright ugly. In August 2019, far-right and left-wing Antifa groups clashed in Portland, Oregon. Among them was Randy Ireland, a veteran and high-ranking member of the far-right Proud Boys. What we're going through right now is, is a war on the U.S. Constitution. The biggest reason why I joined the Air Force myself, you know, is to give back to my country, to serve my country. I think a lot of that kind of came from my up upbringing, you know, the family that I grew up in. You know, very proud to be an American. Uh, very proud of what America stood for, what it represented around the world. Very patriotic. And I think a lot of those things are what's last today. Members of the Proud Boys and Antifa fought multiple times. And Mayor Ted Wheeler just sent out a statement late today saying this past weekend, quote, put innocent lives at risk. The Proud Boys were founded in New York City in 2016. The government of Canada officially classifies them as a terrorist organization. We're a Western chauvinist. What that essentially means is that we're the biggest cheerleaders for Western values, Western culture. Small government, maximum freedom, maximum liberty, pro-First Amendment, pro-Second Amendment, glorifying the entrepreneur, venerating the housewife. We're not militaristic in any way, shape, or form. The fact of the matter is you have good guys in this world, you have bad guys in this world. And the only way to stand up to the bad guys is to fight them. The group made international headlines after a presidential election debate in 2020. What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and white right like supremacists. White proud supremacists boys. and right proud, proud boys. boys. Stand back and stand by. The left. When I saw the president of the United States telling an extremist violent organization, stand by, that was a chilling moment. That was a chilling moment. For me, it wasn't any different than a president of the United States telling Al-Qaeda or telling ISIS, look, I have a tough election, stand by. Let me tell you what you need to do. Did we get a lot of notoriety? A absolutely, of course we did. But at the very same time, it's, it's not because we're racist, it's not because we're white supremacists. If we think about what the militant right and white power movement looks like today, there are many of these groups. The specifics can change from group to group, but the overall intent is the same. The common ideology is simple. Uh, we had power. We should have power. Power is being taken away from us. And by any means necessary, we can get it back. Fascist groups, you have National Socialist groups, you have Southern Nationalist groups, you have all types of groups with all types of creeds, but ultimately we're all being united because we all believe in the same thing, which is ultimately that white people have a right to exist. And whether the we is a white we, Jews will not replace us. whether the we is an anti-government we, they're all intertwined. The more laws they pass, it's going to end up the people versus the government. Right now we're being peaceful. In the future, nobody knows when that breaking point's going to be. Hit. Should have hit a long time ago, personally, for me. A lot of people think that, ah, you know, these are knuckleheads. And we shouldn't worry about them. Unfortunately, we said the same thing about the jihadis prior to the events of 9-11. By the time we decided to go after them, it was a little bit too late. As well as the Proud Boys, other far-right extremist groups include the Oath Keepers and Three Percenters. Many of their followers are former police and military personnel. I would like to think that we would draw the attention of people that are from the military, f with a military background. And I think it, it, it would be true of like the three percenters or the old keepers. The one thread that kind of combines all of our groups is the U.S. Constitution, our respect for it. And I signed up to defend this country, I was essentially joining the three percenters already. The oath of enlistment is the exact oath of a three percenter. I do solemnly swear. I do so solemnly swear. And I will support and defend the Constitution. And I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Of the United States. 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 Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic.
In Atlanta, I met up with 3% SF and some of the other brothers out there, and everybody was upset about the election. You know, I mean, basically we're looking at a criminal that has become our president illegitimately. Joe Biden has already harmed this country. His son has already harmed this country. We know for a fact that that family is a criminal family. The situation we're in is a situation of treason. The punishment for treason is death. In America, you have the right to be an asshole. You have the right to have the most pathetic views in the world. I don't have to agree with you. You don't have to agree with me, but that is a right protected by the First Amendment. I think when we talk about violent extremist groups, we're, talk we're talking about individuals that go beyond the narrative to violence. People who are planning to uh, attack the U.S. government because it's an evil empire. People who are trying to, you know, kill Jews or kill immigrants or uh, kill black people just based on their race or on their religion. When you move away from the narrative, as ugly as that narrative is, to carry out violence based on that narrative, to recruit individuals to carry out violence based on that narrative, then you're a violent extremist. Then you're frankly a terrorist. January 6th now, a militia group had stashes of guns on the outskirts of DC, ready to go on that fateful day during the insurrection. That's just one of the alarming allegations from the Justice Department today after the feds charged the leader, Stuart Rhodes, and several members of the right-wing group, the Oath Keepers, with seditious conspiracy. Stuart Rhodes is a former U.S. Army paratrooper with a law degree from Yale. In 2009, he founded the Oath Keepers. The extremist organization recruits many of its members from among law enforcement officials, active soldiers, and veterans. The group quickly evolved into an armed militia seeking to overthrow the government. The Capitol attack in January 2021 wasn't the first time Rhodes had mobilized his force of around 35,000 followers, some of them heavily armed. In September 2020, protests broke out in Louisville, Kentucky. A black woman, Breonna Taylor, had been shot dead in her home by police, and the initial trial of the incident led to the acquittal of the officers involved. Rhodes and the Oath Keepers joined local militia groups in Louisville to take action against the protesters. We're here in Louisville to protect the Shell Station and also the pawn shop across the street and also a private residence. We can't predict the unpredictable. We can't predict chaos. We can't predict stupid. My main message is you gotta get ready and prepare yourselves and your communities for what we see coming, where I think it's unavoidable now. You got too many brainwashed Americans who have been brainwashed by communist professors and teachers to hate their own country. What do you do with someone that hates your own country, that hates you, by a close extension, if you believe in your country still? Three, two, one. one. It's almost like we're in a foreign country doing a stability operation against an insurgency. One of our guys up there is SF, Special Forces Vet. We have another one that's a retired staff sergeant, SF. I'm not surprised that extremist organizations try to recruit veterans for the credibility that we bring, but also for our commitment. Um, and that commitment takes a lot of forms. I mean, veterans are people in our society who in many ways have said, I will do whatever is necessary to preserve what I believe in, to preserve the baseline values and the baseline existence of my society, up to and including violence. Uh, put a scope on them, take a peek at them, see what they got. That's the same kind of shit they've been doing their whole career. You know, now they're doing it here inside the United States. It's been a weird feeling. I had two Purple, two purple Hearts already in a bronze stock. They said, David, the only way we'll call you back in is if the shit is going to hit the fan. I came home to visit my mommy. Chris would be talking. I was taking a shower. She come pounding on the door early in the morning. She pointed the TV about the time second airplane hits, 9-11. Well, three weeks later, I was getting my shots. Our group was the second group to enter Afghanistan. Oh, yep. yeah, man. It's, it's so enticing. I mean, I, um, God, you get to fight again, you know? It's, um, 
you know, you're trained in certain things. You know, you can see the battlefield better. Uh, if you believe the country is under attack, you have a certain set of skills that maybe you were trained uh, trained with that you can, you know, help the group around you, right? You're a force multiplier. They're coming. Hey guys, everybody spread out, get eyes open, get a good perimeter. Get on fire, we can shoot on them, man. Yep. We're very f***ing well. Hopefully they like to get on fire. When I was 21 and severely damaged from a war that I had been lied into and that my friends were dying for, when a guy like Stuart Rhodes comes along with a Yale Law degree and they see the eye patch, they don't know that he shot himself at a range, but they assume he's a combat wounded vet and says like, hey, you can support and defend the Constitution of the United States standing with us and just, you know, repeats the words of the, the, the Second Amendment. That, that's all it took for me to be like, okay, you know, you know, you've got the pedigree, you've got the background, so why should I challenge that? You know, I, I have no basis in, in experience or education to challenge it. Not gonna let them get anywhere near us. Yeah, no, because we're gonna paint the streets, man. The challenge with having veterans directly involved is twofold. The first is that they bring a certain expertise. They might bring in organizational skills or military skills that can make a movement more dangerous. All right, form up, let's go. The second thing that's disturbing, however, is particularly in our society, veterans have legitimacy. They have a particular place of respect. And when we see veterans involved in something, it gives some component of legitimacy to that cause. Very blind. Veterans have a kind of social cachet that provides cover for a lot of the extremist activity that these groups are trying to do. So if you turn out to a protest with a bunch of people in uniform, much like if you turn out with a bunch of women, um, you have a different kind of reception than if you turn out wearing, say, swastikas and hoods and robes. So when we think about this, this is along the lines of something like choosing to come out in polo shirts and khakis or choosing to come out in funny Hawaiian shirts as part of Boogaloo. Those are deliberate decisions that are made to create the opportunity for public reception. And the use of veterans is one way to do this among several. I've not been a part of any militia beforehand, but once they opened up and said that they were doing all this BLM and they, you know, I've yeah, seen my city yeah, on fire, yeah, I, I was just like, I've had enough. And so I, you know, I reached out to my local militia and, you know, I've, I've been with them ever since. Yeah, straight back. When you're vulnerable and you're looking for family, because that's what the people you serve with are, they look like they could be family. They look like they can provide you that sense of purpose, that mission, that camaraderie that you had in the military, that you became dependent on, that became the center of your identity, they could give that back to you. And when he tells you to fight, you have no reason to question that because he's giving you purpose and he's giving you a mission. Would you say the Oath Keepers are preparing for potential violence on and around the election day? Yeah. Yeah, we got our people across the country um, making plans, but there's too many of us. There's too many veterans, first of all, too many freaking military veterans. That's one thing. I'm not a big fan of the war on terror. It did a, I wrote about a lot of our rights. One thing it did give us is a massive pool, huge pool of combat veterans. And about 95% of them are on the conservative side. or on the side of the Constitution. Yeah. So it's not gonna play out very well. There's the man behind the curtain pushing everybody out. You know, these, these are the half-cocked plans, the guys who go early. The people you really have to worry about are the people you don't even know exist until you're two years into the conflict. Because they're tactically patient and they're watching you. Oh my God! And I still am absolutely stunned that people don't see how awful January 6th was and what an indicator that is and how it's escalating. And anybody who says that this can't happen in a worse way, either they're ignorant um, or they're part of the problem. Overran the Capitol! We're in the People shouldn't look at the insurrection at the Capitol as an anomaly. 
we should pay attention to the pattern that got us there. White power! White power! We will fight! We American history already provides one example of an extremely successful terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan. And although it started as a veteran social organization, it very quickly pivoted to extra-legal violence targeted at African Americans, which included night writings, lynchings, serial rape, serial murder. All of these things were designed to create terror in African American communities, to control labor pools, to control local politics, and to keep African Americans from the polls. One of the main parts of the Jim Crow era was something that we would think of today as election subversion. And we would see in states like Georgia, where they refused to seat 33 state legislatures. We saw in states like Louisiana, where they refused to seat a duly elected United States Senator. In North Carolina, where they held a coup to overthrow black leadership in Wilmington. In 1870, the U.S. Constitution was amended to give all male citizens the right to vote. But many African Americans were still held back from voting, including by force. The Klan managed to keep African Americans from voting for 100 years. Uh, that is an astonishing political success. And it happened because the Klan was politically powerful, really well connected, largely in the Democratic Party, not just in the South. and was able to establish itself as a counter power that would stop the emergence of new voters, and whether those voters were blacks or indeed Catholics, who they didn't see as genuinely American. This is the Klan that reached a membership of some 4 million people and 10% of the state of Indiana. They were parading in public on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. It comes to a head in 1924. The Democratic Party has a convention in Madison Square Garden, and the Ku Klux Klan decides that it's going to stop the Democratic Party from condemning Klan violence, and they pretty much take over the party and make sure that it is running on their agenda. Now. If you want the optimistic story, four years later, the Democratic Party changes. If you want the pessimistic story, a major political party gets co-opted and taken over by a violent insurrectionist terrorist movement. The Klan's influence on the Democratic Party of the time soon ended. But 100 years later, there are still attempts to prevent free and fair elections for all citizens. You rigged my f***ing election, you f***ing piece of s***. We're going to try you, and we're going to hang you. We're talking about 50 and 60 year old ladies that are just, that have just been working elections their whole life. Or respected leaders on, on both sides that are being inundated with some of the worst types of threats that you can imagine. You and your family will be killed very slowly. The death threats came by text to Trisha Raffenberger, wife of Georgia's Secretary of State, as Trump attacked him incessantly for standing by the election results in Georgia. He's an enemy of the people. Intimidation is a form of voter suppression and goes hand in hand with, with election subversion, both in our history and today. They're trying to rig an election and we can't let that happen. I hope you're all gonna be poll watchers. The entire poll watching program for the Trump campaign was called Army for Trump. We need every able-bodied man, woman to join Army for Trump's election security operation. The underlying narrative, the messages that were pushed were one of we need to go protect and stop fraud from uh, coming into our elections. It was a very militaristic campaign. Army for Trump enlisted the support of groups like True the Vote, which had large numbers of veterans in its ranks. As a veteran, we're sworn to support and defend the Constitution. My brothers and I were willing to shed our blood on the battlefield to protect the beliefs of the Iraqi people so they can vote. So I'm asking you as Americans to take involvement in this vote. And the idea that military service entitles you to talk about protecting the Constitution is a real problem because it gives a level of justification that these groups do not deserve and have not earned. If you have any information about ballot harvesting in your state, go to True the Vote. It's called truethevote.org. And I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people in this audience saw plenty. If there's always this underlying belief that people are trying to game this system in an unfair way, 
then regardless of the intent of the people that are, are, are brought into that system, that default will always be there to, to police that vote. Then we know that that's going to have a disproportionate impact on communities of color. We're trying to build an army here that will have the confidence and, and, and courage to come down in here in these areas where we really need um, poll workers. This is where the fraud is occur occurring. You know, those areas that he was pointing out, there are no allegations of any sort of voter fraud or shenanigans taking place there in 2020 at all. The only thing that's known is that black and brown people vote heavily in those areas. Just like the rest of the U.S., Harris County has seen a sharp fall in the proportion of residents that are white. 50 years ago, whites made up around 80% of the U.S. population. But according to a 2015 census forecast, they could be a minority by 2044. The demographic change of the United States away from being a white majority country towards a multiracial nation and a multicultural nation is what moves it from simply, aha, my community is becoming multiracial and our politics will change because of this, to we have to stop this because if people can vote and exercise their rights, the white majority will be imperiled. After the 2020 election, Republicans in Georgia and several other states passed laws to restrict voting access. We can get to the same place through bureaucratic violence, as some would say, as we can get to through actual violence and intimidation. And when you marry those two, then you are in a unique era of suppression and anti-democratic efforts. Hardline Republicans in Robertsville, Missouri, came together in the summer of 2021 to show support for their candidate for the U.S. Senate. We know that there's groups today uh, that have brought havoc to our great cities across America. This militant Marxist groups, Lord, that uh, would destroy us from being a greatness. I pray against them, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And everybody said a big old amen. amen. You, joyful warriors and patriots, have watched as your tyrannical governments have separated you from your churches, from your schools, from your prosperity, right? From your families, from your businesses. But now you can fight back, because that's what we do. We fight back. They're trying to make us a socialist country. Yes. Maybe they're trying to make us a communist country. Yes. Yes. I am deadly serious. The next three years is going to determine whether we remain a free country. That's why all over America, we need people like Eric, particularly in the Senate. He's still on the front lines. And the day after the election, he said, you know what, we got some serious irregularities here. We need to look into this fraud. And what did you hear from the mainstream media? Over and over again, they said, oh, that's just crazy. You can't do that. You can't say that there's any fraud in the election. Well, I'm proud to tell you, I'm the only person in this race from Missouri who went down to the front lines in Arizona myself to look at the election audit. Eric Reitens is a highly decorated former Navy SEAL and a Rhodes Scholar. A former Democrat, he wrote several best-selling books after he left the military. Strength and Compassion is a book of photographs and essays from eight different countries where I did international humanitarian work and documentary photography. He also co-founded an influential nonprofit veterans group called The Mission Continues. In 2016, he was elected governor of Missouri, but resigned two years later amid fundraising and sex scandals. In 2021, he began his campaign for the U.S. Senate. When I took the oath to serve in the United States military, I took an oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and domestic. And folks, let's be clear. 
We have a fight on our hands for this country, and we're here to let the mainstream media know, and let the left know, and the establishment know, and let the rhinos know that we are going to win, and we're taking back our country. There's a cadre of Iraq and Afghanistan era veterans who were trained in elite military units, who went to elite schools. A plus, we're with you all the way. Who know better and over the last few years have seen Trump's rise to power and rather than be disgusted by it because it goes against all of our values. They don't live by those values. Strike the fear in the hearts of liberals everywhere, folks. They understand when they're lying. They understand when they're fueling hatred. I say it all the time, right? I think the election was stolen from Trump, and technology companies would not let us talk about the fact that Joe Biden is, a, is the leader of the world's biggest crime family. And they Those recognize the that they need to do it in order to achieve power. Part of the problem for the young veteran, too, is that some of these manipulative voices are former high-ranking military leaders. General Michael Flynn! Yeah. Yeah. So when you hear somebody who held sway over you when you were in uniform, and now they're out and they're still commanding that respect, that, that has just such a strong purpose. Trump won. He won. He won, he won the popular vote, he won the popular vote, and he won the electoral college vote. Ah, uh, you know, Flynn's, Flynn's a character. He's something special. You know, it comes a little bit from the camaraderie of, of being a military person. I can look at Flynn, and I can see that he's, he's got some really, really deep love for this country and respect for it, and he does respect his oath. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I, I base my life on facts and judgment and what I believe is right for this country, for this country, period. Flynn has been exposing truth left and right, and that's what makes him one of the most dangerous men in America. Michael Flynn is a former three-star general in the U.S. Army. His specialty was military reconnaissance. The soldiers he commanded were highly successful in putting down insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan. President at the time, Barack Obama, appointed him director of the Defense Intelligence Agency in the summer of 2021. Three years later, the former Democrat had become an ardent Trump supporter and openly called for the arrest of Trump's rival, Hillary up. Clinton. That's right. Yeah, that's right, lock her up. In January 2017, he became national security advisor to President Trump. But just over three weeks later, Trump fired him for allegedly concealing his ties to Russia. Flynn initially made a deal with prosecutors, and then when the case against him was still pending, he was pardoned by Trump at the end of 2020, shortly before the president left office. Disgraced former general Michael Flynn, convicted felon. He uses general like it's his first name. I'm his Facebook friend. His Facebook name is Jen Flynn. On Telegram, he's General Flynn. He's using his rank as part of his identity. And he has adopted the radical fascist politics of MAGA and of QAnon. Where we go one, we go all. Where, Where we, we go, go one, one, we go all. God bless America. To build himself up as a leader for an insurgency against the people of the United States. This country is awake. This is soil that we have fought over and we will fight for in the future. He could take military capabilities and he could place them in those states and basically rerun an election in each of those states. Clearly his military experience influences some people to give him legitimacy that he might not otherwise have. I'm a simple Marine. I want to know why what happened in Minamar can't happen here. No reason. I mean, it should happen here. No reason. Right? That's right. That endorsement of an armed coup was not the only time the former military intelligence officer had questioned his government's legitimacy. 
as you learn the ability to lead, whether it's military or not, you learn the ability to get people to do stuff. And that's just what he's doing. We are in a crucible moment in the history of the United States of America. We're fighting with faith, we're fighting with courage, and nothing can resist the power of prayer. He perverts this military experience, this religious experience, to evoke this kind of feeling of a higher purpose. When I left the military, I was a hardcore Republican. I was a libertarian, like a, a lot of people in the military. I was looking at like, I can't even call them documentaries, but these YouTube videos, like uh, this movie Zeitgeist. You had better wake up and understand that there are people who are guiding your life and you don't even know it. Now that I study extremism, I recognize it's <laughs> filled with anti-Semitic tropes. It, the theme of the movie without explicitly saying it is that Jewish people are out there controlling the banks and the banks are the reasons why we go into war. So therefore the Jews are responsible for my friends dying, right? That's the connection that it's trying to make. The ultimate goal is to get everybody in this world chipped with a chip with an RFID chip and uh, have all money be on those chips and everything on those chips. And if anybody wants to protest what we do or violate what we want, we just turn off the chip. I just absorbed this propaganda and fell for it fell into it. And all of these concepts started to fit together and feed this narrative, this, this idea that I had felt but couldn't put words to for so long, that I was the victim, not just of circumstance, but of some sort of nefarious group of powerful individuals who were manipulating all of us and, and that everyone was just acting as puppets, you know, what people now call the deep state. But we were awake. And it was our job to wake everybody else up. Who's a patriot? Video. Yep. That's... There's a lot there. They flashed photos of the pyramid on our dollar bills. They showed a picture of George Soros. They talked about the World Bank. Everything's incorporated. These are all things that I didn't understand when I was watching my propaganda videos uh, back in 2007, 2008. But man, I mean, it's like they just took notes off of the shit that had me all confused and crazy back then. And the second thing was my family. Anybody that's, anybody that's These groups have always operated on a playbook of using the prevailing social context to mobilize people, recruit, and radicalize. The 20s Klan was anti-Black and anti-Jewish. But it was also anti-Mexican near the border, anti-labor in the Pacific Northwest, anti-immigrant in the Northeast where there were a lot of immigrants. What it did was figure out what the prevailing social tensions were in a given community and use those to recruit people for its own purposes. Returning Vietnam War veterans felt betrayed by society, the government, and the media. Their disenchantment and sense of being misunderstood made them easy prey for a new wave of violent extremism one driven by conspiracy theories, who believed an enemy was aiming to eradicate all of society from within. The Cubans are coming in by the thousands. The Mexicans are coming in by the millions. The, the Haitians are coming in from uh, Haiti or wherever the, that little near country is, coming in by the hundreds of thousands. White people have had enough. They can no longer even afford to buy proper housing for themselves. Yet our government would have us spend thousands and thousands of millions of dollars on non-whites. They've had enough. One of the key figures in the white power movement after the Vietnam War and one of the architects of its move to cell-style terrorism, to using the early internet, and to a number of other major changes that fueled its rise is a veteran named Lewis Beam. The only thing that's important tonight is will America be white 100 years from tonight? And if so, will you commit yourself to the battle to make it so? 
Louis Beam served two tours as a helicopter gunner in the Vietnam War. He was awarded several medals for valor. After he returned in 1968, he brought his military experience to the Ku Klux Klan, quickly rising through its ranks. I've been paid by the government $300 a month to fight and kill communists or execute them, whatever term you want to use, uh, in Vietnam. And what is the difference between Vietnam and Houston, Texas, but a few thousand miles? <laughs> One of the reasons that Beam rose so quickly in these organizations is that he told a story about warfare and trauma that a lot of other people were mobilized by, including people who didn't serve. I saw a young man, about 19 years old, entrapped in a armored personnel carrier in about 22 miles northeast of Saigon, with his legs pinned beneath the seat as a result of a a rocket propelled grenade, and he stayed on the radio, kept asking for help, asking us to come get him. So his argument was about the wrongness of war, the horror of seeing casualties in the field, the horror of losing your fellow soldiers, but his pivot was this is why we should come back to the United States and bring that violence home to everybody who left us there. Our mission is a reconnaissance patrol. We have information that the enemy is in the area. Oh! The Jews have assumed leadership of the federal government. They totally control it, and they're controlling us thusly. The government that's in Washington, D.C. today does not represent the interests of the white people. Therefore, we will replace them with people who will represent the ideals of white Western Christian civilization. How are we going to replace them? By any means necessary. Beam's rhetoric and his militarism attracted the attention of the FBI. In 1983, he settled in Hayden Lake, Idaho, a haven for white supremacists. He joined forces with Aryan nations and began to command a cell-style terrorist movement of white power activists. The idea was that one or a few white power activists could work together towards a commonly held set of goals and targets, but without prosecutable ties between them and without direct ties to movement leadership. With cells spread all over the U.S. and Canada, the extremists' next step was to start communicating with each other. Beam wanted them to be able to exchange ideas and forge networks. So they created a social network called LibertyNet, and one of the first postings was titled Online for God and Country. And then Lewis Beam traveled around the country teaching people how to go online. These message boards included assassination lists and ideological content and who you should hate and why, but they also included social network content like personal ads. And this was in 1984-85, way before most people think about far-right online activism, decades before Facebook. Can't beat that with a stick. Thanks to this early internet bulletin board, clan groups, skinheads, neo-Nazis, and other extremist organizations banded together. Across the U.S., they carried out robberies, bombings, and murders. Lewis Beam has been charged in 1985, the Department of Justice decided that the network was a threat to national security. Two years later, Lewis Beam was charged with seditious conspiracy. But the trial ended in a farce, with Beam and his co-defendants acquitted of all charges. Following that humiliation, the Justice Department halted all investigations into the white power movement as a domestic terrorist threat. We don't have any domestic terrorism legislation. We don't have domestic terrorism laws. For example, the number one tool um, FBI agents and prosecutors use to disrupt uh, terrorist attacks in the United States is material support. Material support is basically a charge to levy on individuals who are helping a terrorist organization or a violent organization. Unfortunately, we don't have that when it comes to domestic terrorist organizations. 
The problem with this situation is when you don't have domestic terrorism laws, you need an act to happen. You need a hot body in order to start an investigation. And usually you can charge that individual with hate crime or with other charges, but you cannot charge them with terrorism. You cannot go after the whole network. Holy cow. About a third of the building has been blown away. It is just devastating. A massive car bomb exploded outside of a large federal building in downtown Oklahoma City, shattering that building, killing children, killing federal employees, military men, and civilians. Even Timothy McVeigh, he blew up a whole federal building, and prosecutors could not charge him or his associates with terrorism. The bombing of Oklahoma City in 1995 was the largest deliberate mass casualty event on American soil between Pearl Harbor and 9-11. But most people still don't understand what that event was and what it meant. The indictment charges that Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, former army buddies with a grudge against the government, planned the bombing, selected the murder. McVeigh and Nichols met each other through their service. They trained together at Fort Riley, Kansas, before McVeigh deployed to the Gulf as part of Big Red One Infantry Unit in Iraq. There, he seems to have experienced some amount of traumatic combat before their return home. After washing out of Special Forces, he was really angry. And we see at that moment, his deepening involvement in radical white power activity. McVeigh used his military training to carry out the bombing in Oklahoma City. In a letter to a friend, he cited his military oath as justification for the attack. I have sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign or domestic, and I will. Blood will flow in the streets. Good versus evil. Free men versus socialist wannabe slaves. Pray it is not your blood, my friend. The other key component here was his use of the Turner Diaries. Timothy McVeigh often referred to the Turner Diaries, a dystopian novel that offered a description of how one could overthrow the U.S. government. The fictional revolutionaries first blow up a federal building, then they eliminate their political enemies, including all Jewish, Black, and Latino people. The Turner Diaries became enormously important to this movement, not because it's a good book, but because it provides the imaginative answer to a really important question, which is how can a tiny group of people, a small fringe movement, do what they're setting out to do in this period, which is to overthrow the most militarized superstate in world history. In 1997, McVeigh was sentenced to death for the murder of 168 people and for blowing up a federal building. There was no charge of domestic terrorism. It was assumed that he and Terry Nichols had acted alone. Just imagine if Timothy McVeigh's name was Muhammad. We will look at the terrorism threat in a very different lens. First of all, we will look at it as a terrorist threat. We will go after McVeigh. We will go after all the people who are helping him or who are assisting him. We will keep the investigation going in order to get the whole network. And when you are very limited with the tools uh, you are using, these groups will take benefits from it. These are not lone wolves. These are people who are united by ideology, by social ties by a selection of targets. These are all part of the same movement. And this is really what we're seeing continuing into our present day moment. Tonight, the plot to kidnap a governor foiled by the FBI. In October 2020, less than a month before the presidential election, 14 men were arrested over a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. After discussing plans to storm the state capitol and take hostages, the men settled on targeting the governor individually while on vacation. Among the plotters were members of the Wolverine Watchmen, a paramilitary group partly founded by veterans. Prosecutors contend that they wanted to kidnap her to try to ignite uh, another American civil war before the 2020 election in hopes of disrupting it and perhaps keeping Joe Biden from becoming president. The conspirators faced various charges. The majority were convicted and sentenced to prison terms of up to 20 years. The group's leader, Adam Fox, telling the informant he was inspired by Oklahoma City bombing terrorist Timothy McVeigh, telling the informant, if we can't have our world, they can't have theirs, burning it down. As Lewis Beam said, If we can't have this country, nobody gets it. Is that clear? There'll be total ashes everywhere. 
The goals of this insurgency in Michigan were to take over the state house and then to kidnap and execute the governor. The goal of the insurgency on January 6 was to overturn the results of a democratic election. So if we see this as part of a movement, it's to stop the American people being able to choose their own leaders. An insurgency is all about seizing control of a government, not through winning an election, not through democratic processes, not through persuasion, but through violence. It's, an, it's a form of war. If you look at January 6th, what we're looking at is really the collision of three different streams of activity. One is the organized white power movement that is coming off of decades, if not generations, of organizing armament, training, and ideological content. They want to know what the orange has to stand for. Fucking proud boy. Another is QAnon, which is newer, more radical, works very fast. Where we go one, we go all. Where and the final one, the biggest all. one, is simply the Trump base. We want Trump! We want Trump! We want Trump! Gather together in the heart of our nation's capital for one very, very basic and simple reason, to save our democracy. And we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. DC is a motherfucking war zone. The groups that stormed the Capitol on January 6th were not able to undo the election. But that doesn't mean their actions had no effect. There's footage of Proud Boys directing journalists to read the Turner Diaries. Read the Turner Diaries. <laughs> yeah. On January 6th, the Turner Diaries was structuring a lot of sort of the imaginative, performative action of that day. The noose hung outside the Capitol refers to events in the Turner Diaries called the Day of the Rope, which is the hanging of race traitors, which include politicians. <laughs> And significantly, there is a strike on the Capitol that is not supposed to be a mass casualty attack. In the Turner Diaries, it's a mortar attack. It's meant to be simply the selected killing of a few corrupt legislators in order to show other white people that extremists can strike at the heart of American power. Yeah! 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 We did it! We did it! We f***ing did it! Yo, take laptops, paperwork, take everything! Take those All that shit. My friend, my friend sitting in the pillars right now. And by that measure, I think that they succeeded. Donald Trump tweeted out a video. He said, we did a good fucking job. January 6th was a huge success for them. January 6th inspired uh, so many people, not only here in the United States, but even in Europe, that violence is the way to change the government is a way to change that establishments in the Western world that they consider corrupt, they consider evil, uh, they consider that these governments are nothing but tools to the Jews or to whatever conspiracy they believe in. The rich people in the world are using this disease and exaggerating it to create some sort of apocalyptic nightmare, right? You think it's common sense that we all have to stay inside and be afraid of the air? You look at January 6th, I think the people that were there that participated in it, number one, they wanted it to serve as a wake-up call to those people who are in power. And the fact of the matter is, every single person that was there that day is a patriot of this nation. Yo, Randy, maybe you want to put the beers inside the, 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 the fridge. Maybe you want to get off your ass and do something. Being a patriot, being a person that loves their country, especially, you know, being a military veteran, you take an oath to the Constitution. And for a lot of those people that were there that day, they felt that their constitution was being shredded up. Our democracy was being shredded right in front of our eyes. I think it's absolutely heartbreaking to see veterans involved in these things. And I know for a lot of them that their hearts are in, in some ways in the right place. That we just don't live in the same world of truth anymore. Yeah. 
The people in D.C., they were Americans, yeah, and they were patriots. They only broke laws because the D.C. police didn't do their job. Okay, okay. That's it. People died because they didn't do their job. So they broke into the Capitol because D.C. police didn't do their job. The D.C. police They didn't break into anything. They let them in. They in. They, not only did they let them in, it's paid for by tax dollars. It's sure. their property. Sure. Sorry. This is the lethal danger of the big election lie, right? It's This is a conspiracy theory that says the very heart of American political life, the very heart of our democracy has been destroyed and taken from us, which leaves us what recourse? Do I believe the election was stolen? Absolutely, without a doubt. There's no way in hell Joe Biden was elected. 81 million votes for Joe Biden? I don't think so. We're in a situation right now where, you know, we can't trust our elections anymore. We know that. So what really is scary is, is that what will the people do? What will the average American do when they finally wake up to the reality of all this? And the answer to that is, we don't know. We have no idea what the American people will do. This no longer is a constitutional republic, and we are going to fight to bring our constitutional republic back again. We've had violent domestic extremist organizations for a long time, but I think what makes this moment particularly dangerous, there are a couple of things. The first one is the fact that it's able to ride on a wave of conspiracy thinking and general distrust that's happening because of social media technologies, it's happening because of the way we've, we've structured our society on the internet, that gives them the sheer numbers of people uh, that they could never dream of, of bringing to bear on their own. Everybody's got to put their shoulder to the wheel. We need participation 24 seven. We need you to be a force multiplier. As a soldier and as a, as, a, uh, as a general, as a retired general, we have an army of digital soldiers. If you can do command and control over social media and you're fighting against evil and you're on the side of God and you're on the side of the United States and your oath, it's a very attractive proposition. The sad part is, is you're using all those skills and that goodness and that purity of heart that you think is actually absolute unadulterated bullshit. The second major difference is you have political cover from the very top. The only way we're going to lose this election as if the election is rigged. Remember that. January 6th was the culmination of two months of a propagation of a big lie and of conspiracy theories by the president of the United States. Two thirds of House Republicans go along with Trump and vote to overturn the electors on the evening of January 6th. We, a United States Senator and members of the House of Representatives, object to the counting of the electoral votes of the state of Pennsylvania. Madam Speaker, I rise to support the objection. Madam Speaker, I rise to support the objection. Madam Speaker, I rise to support the objection. Madam Chair, I vigorously support this objection. And I ask you In a vote that has always been thought to be ceremonial and ministerial, where you accept the Electoral College results, which were in no serious way contested. I mean, that's almost as astounding as what happened in terms of the insurrection. How can so many people believe that it was unfair? It was because their president said it was unfair. Their senator said it was unfair. Their member of Congress said it was unfair. A full audit is absolutely necessary. We should get injunctions yep. if necessary. And if normally those are people fine. that the electorate can have faith in. I rise for myself and 60 of my colleagues to object to the uh, counting of the electoral ballots from Arizona. Uh, is the objection in writing and signed by a senator? Yes, it is. It is. And the Republican Party didn't stop there. Congressman Denver Riggleman lost his party's nomination over the weekend. The first term congressman was ousted by former Liberty University employee Bob Good. Getting run out of the Republican Party was really interesting. I believe I was the first one that was affected by Q conspiracy theories when I didn't even know it. I had uh, conducted a same-sex wedding in summer of 2019. Two guys who had worked for me or volunteered, and then and I started hearing these weird things. I'm funded by George Soros. I'm a secret Jew. I'm a secret Dem. I'm trying to change the sexual orientation of children. I'm a tool of the Antichrist. And I'm hearing all this. I'm like, this is, sounds like New World Order crazy stuff. You know, the old anti-Semitic tropes. My two decades of intelligence, warfighting, and counterterrorism experience, coupled with serving in the 116th Congress, is why I will not allow conspiracy peddlers to hijack our ability to conduct reasonable policy discussions for the betterment of all Americans. I was pretty much drummed out and censured for following the law and trying to save this country. And uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm overstating that. 
If one of our two parties is committed to an Orwellian whitewashing of history. If you didn't know the TV footage was a video from January the 6th, you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit. Is committed to propagating or at least not quarreling with a big lie. Uh, the big lie, the big lie is a lot of bullshit. That's what it is. Is committed to not quarreling much with conspiracy theories, is committed to purging those Republicans at the state and local level and at the national level who want to fight back against the lies and the conspiracy theories. That's a big deal. War is literally the continuation of politics by other violent means. Our military forces are the part of our society that, that carries out that peace. Then we come home. And the question is, do we have a political system that functions? Or are we at a point where our own politics, the politics inside our own communities, the politics inside our own country, can only be continued through other means. And we got to be very careful because if you think you have support from the highest levels of government, why aren't you fighting for your country? Aren't you already sort of sworn in to do this? The issue is, is that the people that we are identifying as extremists, they're identifying as patriots or freedom fighters. And that is, it almost sounds like I'm talking about terrorism right now. One of the organizations that I'm particularly interested in uh, is the Patriot Front. They're producing what they refer to as propaganda. They're studying books on fascism because they believe democracy has failed. And their vision for the future is a dominant white race that has captured the Republican Party and has defeated their political opponents by violence or by exclusion. These guys showed up in Philadelphia on the 4th of July, 2021 and assaulted a bunch of people. Nothing came of it because the local cops didn't know what the hell were they were dealing with. So there's a fascist gang who's operating all around the country. Police in Idaho say they prevented a possible domestic terror attack over the weekend. 31 men were arrested, all dressed alike, allegedly on their way to wreak havoc at a pride event in the city of Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene is located right next door to Hayden Lake, Idaho, where Lewis Beam was active. It was the focus of an operation by the Patriot Front. The same hatred and intolerance that saw Denver Riggleman targeted for performing a gay marriage ceremony also drove the Patriot Front to attack the LGBTQ community. While the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters are a threat, the ones that I'm really afraid of are the Gen Z ones, the service members who have served during a time of relative peace, these young people who joined to fight never got a chance to fight, and who, starting in conservative echo chambers online, have been brought into the proud boy to fascist pipeline. So Gab is an alternative social media platform that was created to be a safe space for neo-Nazis. One of the groups on here is the National Justice Party. This is a neo-Nazi party within the United States whose goal is to use protests to radicalize Trump supporters into explicit white supremacy. They're developing new and original propaganda that paint them in a light of achieving the power and the ability to shape politics and engage in violence in a way that they thought they were gonna get from the military. So what they're trying to do is make white nationalism look like it's a testosterone-filled way to be a man. I believe that these young veterans who are getting out and joining things like the Patriot Front and Nationalist Socialist Club, and the word Nazi is Nationalist Socialist. I think that the Republican Party is, is you know, more than capable of adopting that ide ideology in a way that that's unfathomable even to me. You know, I, I never saw us where we are today. I, I think another four years, things could be far worse. The worst case scenario is probably worse than most of us want to imagine. I could see a civil war. 
because this is the same movement we've been dealing with this whole time, it's reasonable to assume that what we can see is only about half of the activity, that there is an underground that is mounting violent action, training in camps, trying to accumulate weapons, and preparing for violence. When you talk about civil war or specific sectors of the country that could go kinetic, just go to these areas where you see the first big far left protests when Republicans take back the House. Boom. If there's anybody out there from Antifa or Black Lives Matters, spin your first f bullet at my chest, okay? Or if Republicans think that one of the state elections were stolen. Boom. Forget writing your legislators. You gotta do something. It's us, it's we the people. You're gonna have to take my life. There's no way. I'll die on this hill. There's no way. No way. All of this can happen. Who's to say that if our legislation came down where we lost our Second Amendment tomorrow, that that wouldn't start a civil war? To be honest with you, I don't know of any veteran that wants war in this country. But at the very same time, when you look back to what our founding fathers wanted for this country, we are so far away from that today. It's just something they're ready for and their gun safe is full. If you're prepared, you're prepared, and if you're not, you're not. If you're armed, then you're somewhat prepared to defend your family and yourself. If you're not armed, you're dog meat. There's imminent civil war. If we don't fix our elections and actually make them bona fide again, we don't have 2024. There is no 2024. There are people in this movement who believe that the nation cannot be saved as it is and must be overthrown in order to make way for a white ethno state. And then there are probably people in this movement who think, aha, there's an opening here to run for office and mount a sort of coup from inside in order to change the very nature of the nation. You know, I worry about scenarios in which, you know, in 2024, uh, one party controls Congress, the other party wins a presidential election, Congress refuses to certify the election. The Republican Party has a pretty systematic plan to have state legislatures impose themselves much more directly into the certification of electors to perhaps also suppress some Democratic votes along the way. So I do think the chances of a real attempt to overturn a legitimate election result are not nothing and they're not tiny. And then somebody as president or people that are elected that aren't, do, are, aren't there in a, in a legal way. And then that's when the dissent happens and that's the end of our country and our legal norms. And that scares the hell out of me. This country, you as individuals, with the individual liberties and the individual rights that you have, you need to start assuming risk for your neighborhoods and your communities and your towns. You have to get involved. General Flynn's ultimate plan is to undermine democracy, is to get his digital soldiers to radicalize the rest of the Republican base. Go run for dog catcher. If you don't like this, who's running your school board, go run for the school board. If you don't like who's running your little town or your little parish, go get involved. If Flynn can convince his followers to push enough good people out of government, they'll beat us into submission. I don't want guys like disgraced former General Michael Flynn to be deciding who's an American and who's not. General Flynn, do you believe the violence on January 6th was justified? I said I, I said fair. Because their movement is about excluding others. It's not about the will of the people. It's about suppressing opposition. It's about power. General Flynn, do you believe in the peaceful transition of power in the United States of America? That's fair. This is how countries fall apart. Part of my experience as a veteran and as somebody who's worked with refugees and done human rights work, I know what happens when the center cannot hold and a, and a society falls apart. I know what happens when your ethnic identity or your in-group, out-group membership becomes a life and death issue and when neighbors start killing each other. I've seen it. And whatever your Twitter bravado about the next civil war is, nobody wants to see that. I mean, that is the road to hell. The very worst case scenario is that we slide to authoritarianism, that we are not able to climb out of this. We have seen this happen over and over and over again in other countries. We have seen them fight back against the first wave and not be ready for the second and not be ready for the third. This is, a, this is gonna take a long time and it's going to take everything we have to make sure that our democracy is still standing at the end of it. I hope that people are scared because being scared motivates people. And I, I want you to be scared by what's true, and I want you to look at evidence, I want you to think critically, 
and do everything within your power and within the uh, confines of, of the law to make sure that we don't live in that dystopian future that could just be a few years away. I went to my son's gravesite. It made me angry that my son's sacrifice almost felt like it was in vain. Now I've refocused and I had to take a look at it and I had to do a lot of soul searching to understand that that's not the case. And this fight is not over. It's far from over and it may never be over, but his sacrifice is not in vain. What if every young American did national service for a year? Maybe in uniform, but not necessarily. What if they did in healthcare, conservation, education? How would they feel about each other at the end of that? By experience, we know you almost always feel different, more tightly. You break down many of your preconceived prejudices against other groups. Trust starts to build. In 2013, I first applied to my local community college. Having had my military experience turn out so negative, I'll be honest, my confidence was destroyed. And I was like terrified of registering for classes because I was terrified of failure. And I went over the course of my first semester at Nassau Community College, fulfilling a lot of bad stereotypes about veterans, you know, coming in, having my headphones on, having my hoodie over my head, kind of just like sitting down, not talking to anybody, not engaging. And a group of student veterans at my community college identified that, recognized that it was a problem and helped to break me of my shell. I went from being that guy who doesn't talk to anybody and sits in the corner to being elected to represent all of the student veterans of my school. It's not something that happened overnight, but it set me on the path towards recovery. Rather than feel like the future was predetermined by these powerful groups and that there was nothing that I could do to fight against them, so I started to accept the idea of maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. And because most of my interactions with the outside world were in person, person to person, I wasn't as easily able to seek out an echo chamber that didn't challenge my opinions, that only reinforced my beliefs. That diversity of opinion is what kept me from you know, joining the Oath Keepers when it first sprang up. That helped to break me out of it. A lot of veterans getting out, they don't have that opportunity. We're in a different world. In this new world, our troops have to be trained to not only defend themselves against a Chinese sniper or a Russian tank, but against enemy disinformation campaigns on the internet. It's also true that disinformation is not just coming from China and Russia. We know how to combat malicious misinformation. We did a pretty good job teaching soldiers and citizens how to not fall for Nazi propaganda. We did a pretty good job teaching soldiers and citizens how to not fall for communist propaganda all through the Cold War. The problem with that, of course, is that you know, opposition to the Nazis was a goal shared by both political parties in America. Opposition to the Soviet Union was a goal shared by most across the political spectrum in America. Right now, this conflict, you know, it's far too partisan, it's far too divisive, and it's far too politicized. We know how to do this, but it takes unity. And this is a layer cake of problems. This is something that does not just exist at, say, DOD policy level. This is about how journalists talk about the movement, how our laws prosecute the movement, how our national leaders direct their time and attention. We know that there is a lack of political will to establish or to create a domestic terrorism law. Yet, I think there is a big possibility that we can designate these groups as international terrorist organizations. So what that means, we can take all the rules, the laws, the authorities that the FBI and other law enforcement and intelligence agencies have to go after them the same way we go after international terrorist organizations. Who's paid a price? Who's paid a price for being a conspiratorial, irresponsible, demagogic extremist, with the exception of a few true believers who were just uh, duped and taken in and foolishly believed all this stuff. Most of them are going about, going along, doing fine. Voters need to decide whether they are comfortable with those who incite violence representing them. And movements like this end when the entire population 
decides that they are unacceptable. We haven't seen that yet. So the ideal solution is de-radicalization, but that's not something I'm interested in. I'm interested in justice, and I'm interested in imposing costs on people who are trying to hurt America and Americans. All I think about all day is finding bad guys and hoping that they end up in jail. Documenting any potentially criminal behavior, documenting things that, if they're not illegal, society would frown upon. And ultimately, it's to put a cost behind being an insurgent within the United States. I'm a Nazi hunter. But it doesn't mean we're going to win, and that's what I want to tell people. This good doesn't always triumph, but I do believe the oath means something, and I know that I'm going directly against people who think that they also are honoring their oath in the same way, and that's why I think this makes this dangerous. But what's enabling that schism to happen? is the lie. Which world of truth do you live in? It's not about commitment to country, that's shared. So the only way back to get back together, the only, the only possibility of reconciliation is a conversation that can occur in, the, you know, in an environment of truth. We can either reconcile with, with each other as a country, or we can have a conflict. Where do I want America to go? Not here, not where we're at. This path we're on will kill us. It'll kill this country, it'll kill freedom. It'll kill our camaraderie, it'll kill our compassion and our human decency for each other. What I'd like to see is for the people on both sides all come together and agree on going by the truth only. If we can do that, then this nation can be salvaged. Do I see that happening? No, I don't. I can hope though.